hello, people who decided to actually stay to the end. Yay! We are looking for a treat because those of you that don't know Mike, well, I apologize in advance. I don't think he's drunk enough yet, but we'll see if we can get him. Get him a drink! I can tell. Enjoy. Oops, I got the donkey. Hello, everybody. I'm the Lover. How are you? Any more interruptions or can I start now? <laughs> so, welcome to my talk. It's called Security Counter Knowledge, and there's a picture of a fishing net, which will be explained directly. So, who am I? Well, I'm from the UK, which is why I sound a little bit funny. I also am um, slightly low, which is why I sound even funnier. Uh, I co founded from Scott's Eyeballs Research. I ran here on occasion. Uh, this is my third time here, and it's the third time it's been going, so maybe there's a pattern magic, who knows? And I'm actually more pissed off than I look, which is pretty impressive. Bear in mind that I'm wearing a pink shirt with, with the words Little Princess written on it. So I'm a pissed off little princess. So, um, I'd like to begin with a couple of quotes. I put this talk into a conference called B-Side at Lisbon because they told me to put in a talk. They actually personally invited me. They then sent me back some nice anonymous feedback. First, the first one I liked was, does he even want to talk about anything? Well, yes, I do. That's why I put in a fucking submission. My next one was that, not interesting. If I want to laugh, I can go watch a comedy. Which is nice because, you know, at least I entertain people. And because of that wonderful, wonderful fucking feedback, I'd just like to extend a very, very large thank you, or fuck you, to B-Size Lisbon. Because if I was a new researcher, that shit would have been devastating. So if you're ever in a position to review submissions for a conference, always invite me because otherwise I'll make you look a dick internationally. <laughs> so, why is there a picture of cross site scripting? Because I am the amazing one-trick pony boy, and every year I come here, I always find cross-site scripting, and I always find cross-site scripting in the same fucking places. Names, namely, downtown Grand Rapids, they have cross-site scripting. Experience Grand Rapids have cross-site scripting. Ride the Rapid, which is still not a porn film, but should be. <laughs> As cross-site scripting. <laughs> and so I'd like to extend a happy birthday to those three organisations, because for three years running, I've told them they have cross-site scripting in the same fucking town that they're in. And they've not listened in three years. Which brings me on to my next one. And I apologise to the individual who I've already spoken to about this. But mytechnews.com have a simple error in the fucking raw. Welcome to 2000, ladies and gentlemen. We are now 13 years in the past. I have the amazing power to time travel using a single fucking quote. So, before I begin, if you're offended by bad language, then you need to fuck the fuck off. This is not the talk for you. You nice, gentle individual. If you're a security professional, you might want to fuck off. If you're apathetic and bored, you might want to fuck off too. And if you expect cogent argument from a hungover Brit, you definitely should fuck off. <laughs> so, what am I going to be talking about? Well, I'm going to be talking about Abby Hoffman, because he was funny. I'm going to be talking about Charles Manson, because he was funny too in a certain way. I'm going to be talking about control, and I'm going to be talking about money. And other shit too. So, what is counter knowledge? Well, science is full. Science is great. Science can actually, you know, save your life and shit. Now, where does science come from? Well, the Enlightenment sought to explain and reform society through reason, which was proven by a repeatable scientific method. Unfortunately, we now live in an age where that shit's gone out of the window, 
And that's why we have homeopathy, not homeopathy, and fireballs. Because science doesn't work, and we don't apply it anymore. And as I say, as an industry, we're not immune. We have lost our way, we're babes in the woods that have wandered off and are buying IDSs and shit. Um, before I go any further, I need to make something very, very plain. This shit here, not right. I love all of you people, you've paid lots of money, you're very nice, you support them, you've, you've, you've probably provided some of the budget to allow me to get drunk, so you're all lovely. All you people behind, however, no, step over the fucking line. If you want power, go and take power. They can't take the power from you. You are the 99%. <laughs> <laughs> Too slow. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hit me, I'm graceful. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get tired before I do. <laughs> okay, he's escalating. <laughs> so, two parts to this talk. One part is really good, one part you're going to get really fucking annoyed at me. And I don't care. So, when you are asked how, how to describe yourself, by somebody other than your mother who knows all of your secrets, including that time you were masturbating in the bedroom, what do you actually say in response? Do you say, I'm a security consultant, I'm a professional, you can trust me with your infrastructure. Do you say, you are an infosec professional, or even worse, a rock star? Ladies and gentlemen, I have seen security rock stars. They are not real rock stars, and neither are their fucking groupies any good. <laughs> Are you a hacker, one of the terrible people who lives on the villainous outer rims of the internet and hangs around in Tatooine bars? Are you a wannabe? There's nothing wrong with that. I'm a wannabe. I'd love to be a professional, unfortunately I'm not. I'm me. Or are you a thought leader? You lead thoughts like fucking Pol Pot. That's what you do. Have you, however, ever described yourself as a fucking serf? who is owned, bought, and sold. Because that is what you fucking are. I am too, and there's nothing wrong. The first, the first solution to a problem is admitting you have one. So, this other industry that we all try and work in, I hope anyway, is a joke. It started as a joke. That's where it's from. And you've all fucking forgotten this when you got professional. But before I explore that, let's look at some history. The 1950s gave the world Elvis. They also gave the world Woody Holly. I mean, come on. A rock and roll singer from Dallas with glasses? That doesn't work. Um, yeah, they also uh, gave the world the Tech Model Railway Club at MIT. Um, the term hacker was used in its proper context, e.g. people finding solutions to problems. Like, how do we get access to that locked room? Pick the bitch. How do we get access to that mainframe? Hack the bitch. That's what the term means. And you can also play pop on a seven scratch, which is fun. The 1960s had the counterculture. And things got really political with a big P. It was like the only time in American history, kind of, where people actually gave a fuck about each other from what we can tell. There was lots of experimentation with new communication and people protest. And then you got coercion and Jerry Rubin went on to be a stockbroker and hippies sold, pro hippies sold property and hippies bought property and the world turned back to the same way it had been in the 1950s. Talking about the hippies, uh, you don't know about me. And it's, it's American history so maybe you don't, which is why I'm to explain it to you. Uh, New Year's Eve, 67, people got stoned, and the hippie movement started. Basically, what people wanted to do was um, react against student, uh, students, for uh, students for a democratic society, and all the preachiness of the new left, and actually just have fucking fun. Because, you know, fun is fun. Talking about fun, they actually managed to shut down the stock exchange for pretty much an entire day. And how did they accomplish that? Because they had $300 in single dollar bills and went to the public gallery and threw it into the pit. And all the other men that were running around, because it was men then, because it was the 60s and shit, 
trying to rule the world and sell millions and millions of dollars worth of stocks, went ape shit and started running around after single dollar bills. <laughs> it was beautiful. Another thing they did, which was equally beautiful, is it was decided that the Pentagon was a magical object because it had five sides. I did explain earlier that they were really fucking high most of the time. And when you're really high, that idea makes sense. So they got together, thousands and thousands of them, and went to the Pentagon and tried to levitate the bitch with the power of force. And it may have worked, there are mixed reports, but there are people still alive that, that swear they saw the fucker move. Again, could be the drugs. 67, there was a pamphlet called Fuck the System, which was written by George Wasecki. George Wasecki, if you don't know, was basically a New York bomber that decided that what he really wanted to do was blow up libraries. Because, you know, he had an overdue fun. Um, basically, it detailed where, ways to eat and sleep and basically be for free, which, you know, is a strange thing to want to write about in the land of the fucking brain. Uh, it went on to be based on form, which is the material in the, in the book, the single this book, which actually wins the best book title ever. Although, you know, you can understand why publishers were a little bit reticent to publish the fucker. So, so what? Why am I talking about this shit? Well, in 71, uh, I've been talking with a guy called Al Bell, who may or may not have been using his real name, um, decided to give, uh, decided to give the world uh, which originally started the Youth International Party Land. And that basically was a published series of scenes in which ways to rip off Marvel were described in intricate detail. How to get telephone calls for free using the power of your imagination alone. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and fucking girls, we had politically motivated activists before we had the fucking internet. They were there, they were playing with phones. So, finding new and inventive ways to interact with stuff is not new. We've all done it, that's why we're here. That's why we have wheels and fire and planes and shit. Political hacking isn't new. Uh, a guy called Johann Most in 1885 wrote a book describing how to make dynamite in your bathtub. Which doesn't actually work, but, you know, it was a nice idea. Uh, if the state exerts too much control over its citizens, Eventually, the citizens start to question the state. You know, change is inevitable. You know, because flux is a constant state. Now, I get to be irritated and take some time off because I'm quite tired. And this is the audience participation part because I'm a lazy bastard. What are the things that you hate? We are going to have, ladies and gentlemen, a two minute hate. Because Big Brother happened, and I always thought that bit in 98 was cool. So, in a couple of seconds, I'm going to stop talking, and then everybody shout out something they hate, even if it's me and my stupid fucking pink shirt. So, go! Yes. Here! Keep going! Hair in my fast food! Keep going! Oh, ah, this is fucking catharsis! That was the room. quietest two minute fucking hate I've ever heard. And it wasn't even fucking two minutes. You bitches are lazy. Or sober. Or both. No more free me from you. So, things I hate. Uh, I hate deification of ultra tech capitalists. I hate it. It pisses me off. I hate the myth of the internet. I hate the mass, e.g. all you people, become singular individuals. And I also hate change taking so fucking long. So, everybody loves Steve Jobs, or Bill Gates, or Linus Torvalds. You know, these people are fucking icons. You all want to be as rich as they are, as successful as they are, maybe not as attractive as they are, because you know, a few issues there. The reason why many people have companies or work for companies is because they want to get fat, and they want to get rich, and they want to have nice shit. But let's look at the best practices of a corporate CEO. Factors that make a good CEO. They need to maximise shareholder profit with minimum expenditure. You know, that helps. They need to engender the loyalty of the group. They need to suppress actions that may be disadvantageous to the group or business dogs. And they need to make impact on change depending on how much of a fucking conscience they have. 
This leads me to conclude that Charles Manson was just as good as CEO as Steve Jobs. That's exactly what Charles Manson did. And I will explain. Charles Manson ate from youngsters for free, therefore maximising profit with limited exposure. He engendered group loyalty. You know, he had followers that fucked him. That's good. He suppressed actions that may be disadvantaged to his goals by chopping people's heads off. That may be bad. And he may or may not have impacted upon change, depending on whether he chopped off your head. Therefore, Steve Jobs, as good or as bad as Charles Manson. And they even kind of look similar, which is eerie. <laughs> so, this isn't my idea. I gleefully stole it from John Wilson, British writer. Read his shit, he's funny. Um, he reckons, and psych psychological research bears this out, that as many as 1 in 25 CEOs have soci sociopathic or psychopathic traits, e.g. they lack fucking basic human empathy and the factors that make nice people. Now, as an industry and as individuals, we don't deify uh, Jim Jones, you know, because of that shit in the yard where he killed like 900 people with Kool Aid. It has to be the worst party ever. But we do deify Steve Jones, you know, who allowed Fox to happen, e.g., suicidal Chinese people going, I can't work 40 hours a day, I'll die, fuck it, I'll kill myself. You know, there, there's a logical disparity between the two. How come, if you are a ass, you get to be a psychopath, but if you get to be rich enough, you get to be an entrepreneur. How the fuck does that work? It's very odd. And how come the supposed critical thinkers who hack shit and make shit and break shit, we accept that as fact? Now, this brings me on to the internet. The internet is like a cake, and I have proof, because the cake is a lie, and so is the internet. So therefore, the internet is cake. So, and now we get to go to sociology in a technical talk. So enjoy this, technologists. The internet is new, is new shit, yeah? And as new shit, academics don't really understand it, yeah? And sociologists especially don't understand it. They largely agree that the internet affords users to impact on different comms, uh, to, to get involved in politics, to consume, consume services and goods, to look at pornography, which is the important bit, and to cross geographic and spatial boundaries. That, happily, because it's spoken by sociologists, is largely bollocks. So, the internet, and the devices that are internet enabled, is about two things. Profit, control. That's what it's now about. The internet comes from our planet. Everybody knows this, they're a true about it. And in the 80s, the US government, by the way, the National Science Foundation, and private telcos, e.g. big corporates, got together and put all the networks together, and that's why we have the internet. Now, without government funding and private corporate funding, we wouldn't have the internet, we would not have the cake. The cake would not exist, because academics can't get shit built, because they haven't got any fucking money. So, can you use the internet to ferment revolts? Can you rise up the citizens and ferment revolt using the internet? Yes. Can you use it to spread the message that you're trying to make with impart? Of course you can. Can you use it to masturbate? And this is the best thing. Yes, you can. <laughs> Rule 34. If you can think it, you can touch yourself in a special way that makes you happy. <laughs> can you use it to buy socks? Yes, you can. And can you use it to do your job? Yes, if you can stop masturbating. <laughs> so, can you do any of that with any degree of anonymity? Probably not. Given what's been said about SSL, you probably can't get away with it no more. Now, the media, and much of the wider population, especially here in mainland Europe and Britain, we don't give a fuck, because you know we've got cameras everywhere. They're all shocked about prison. Everybody had a freak out. And you know, people are rightfully a bit pissed off. But you, because you fucking shouldn't be surprised, who would have fucking thought it that a government funded Bare technology was going to be used by governments to fucking spy using their spy agency. Oh my god, what a fucking shock, however, could it have happened? The internet is doing what it's there for allowing for intelligence agencies to gather fucking intelligence. If they weren't reading your email or retaining your data, they'd be failing their jobs. They're doing what they they are paid to do. 
Now, once I tapped off, Trevor at all. I did it. It was fun. I got a mini off. Few talk about Huxley. I was obviously wrote a book in 1931 called Brave New World. In Brave New World, he described a society that was avaricious, consumer driven, where culture was trivialized, and everybody was fucking everybody else. Like, literally. What does that control? What does that actually, you know, make, remind you of a little bit? It's the motherfucking internet. That's what it is. You know, look at the sites of that. You've got Entertainment Weekly or whatever it's called, which basically trivialises culture of the arse. You've got Amazon, which allows you to buy all the shiny things you want. And you've got Playboy, which allows you to masturbate. Again, the important bit. So, earlier on this talk, I mentioned news. They were largely US in nature and had a US based effect. It is shutting down the stock exchange. Uh, they, they basically disrupted trade for a day, which was cool, and they realised the idea of a free store where people get shit for free and there's no charity involved, it's just take what you need, and they dispersed information, which is useful. That's not unique, it's not common, you know. You've had shit like that before. You have mass share action having a tangible effect. That's why you're not a company anymore, which pisses me off, because if you were, we'd be great. I could make you do my fucking thing, and then maybe somebody would bring me a fucking drink. Now, dissent, if you're not Arab, is dying. Why? Is it because people don't want change? Are you happy with the way things are? Because I'm fucking not. Is it because people get coerced? Is it because they get apathetic? I think that the answer lies in how we communicate as a group. Now, use of the internet has made everybody a one-way orator, and yet I am aware of the irony of that statement whilst I stand on the stage with a fucking microphone in my hands. <laughs> now, if you're remotely technically aware, you are also aware that you're going to be surveilled, even if it's just by Brian Krebs trying to write an article because you sent him some drugs. Nobody ever sent me fucking drugs. There's a public shout, and I have free drugs, because I won't write an article about it, I'll just use that shit. Now, if you, if you are remotely aware that you're surveilled, you can as a little subconscious fear of talking about anything to anyone because you know, you know that other people are listening. Thus, what is an effect, a technology for communication doesn't allow people to communicate freely. Basically, the internet has two rules. Shut up, spend your money. That's what it's there for. Now, if you isolate people from each other, a couple of really interesting things happen. They get depressed and kill themselves, which is cool because then you don't have to feed them. Um, they stop plotting, which is good because you know you stay in power. And if you enforce or reinforce the pointlessness of protest, then you know societal control just bends. It doesn't break. There are no revolutions. Look at the 1990 movement. That was so fucking trivialised by the press. That actually was people trying to impact on direct fucking change. With options like fucking bunch of weirdos. The internet is a really effective mechanism for isolating people. Events like this are real, are rare, because usually we sit behind our computers. That's what we do. Also, cake is fucking tasty. So, a little segue, because, you know, I can do that. My talk, my rules don't like it, leave. As an industry, pen testing has been around since the mid-90s, as a commercial offering. Earlier this year, in March, something really interesting happened. Um, you had the Karma Botnet, which basically scanned the entire IPv4 address space for Telnet and used default press to try and bust its way in. And then once it was in, went off and scanned all the hosts. That's what it did. It gained access via Telnet to 420,000 hosts. So, it also made pretty graphs which light up and everything is cool. So, what we had was an utterly, utterly illegal order that was utterly, utterly fascinating. You know, it was great, this shit should have been sponsored. We are, as an industry, failing, and we continue to fucking fail. Out there, right now, are 420,000 boxes with default creds on one port. Now, if you extrapolate how many other computers there are, that could get quite Oh, look at this. 
Thank you, darling. And it's even proper, see? It's real beer, not that American pish that you drink. <laughs> now, my conclusion, other than set piss out of the Bureau of Breweries in, in the beer state, in the beer in Montreal state or town or wherever the fuck I am this week. Thank you! <laughs> my conclusion is that many people out there don't actually fucking care at all. That's why you've still got 420,000 boxes with open fucking telnet. Because people don't give a fuck. No matter how much you try and terrify them, people don't care. We fail. So, this brings me to part two of my talk, in which I actually talk about something shiny. And nobody else has been allowed to be, to be told about the shiny thing, because I've not presented this research anywhere. And the only reason, the, the only reason I'm presenting it here is because is because Gert calls lovely, because they bring you Guinness. And that's why I'm doing this. This is, this is called fucking payback. And you know, I get to share it with you people. So, what we have established thus far, Charles Manson is better than Steve Jobs. The internet is made of cake. And it may well be possible to levitate the Pentagon if we all just think really hard about it. Communication is vital. To effectively communicate, I would claim you have to be anonymous, or at least very careful about who you speak to. Numerous technologies are out there that allow for anonymous calls. Numerous technologies are out there that are supposedly resistant to network-based attacks. <laughs> so, one way of doing it is via ITP, which was started by Germans in 2003, so 10 years ago. Uh, it's a network layer, and it allows users to transmit data in an anonymous manner, or sort of anonymous manner. It's message based, but it's got full library support, so you can pretty much send whatever you want via it. How it works? You send data through nodes. Nodes encrypt, and they pack that data in both inbound and outbound network tools. Very simple. It's transmitted data, and it's terminated at the endpoint, and the encryption gets taken off. Um, it's, a software, it's a network layer and can be used with secondary software because it's network based. And as well as the network layer, ITP, like it all, has got their own TLD.ITP, which are called EAP sites, which can be anonymously hosted amongst the ITP network. Addressing is resolved via a proxy and you know, all plays very nicely. That's what the router looks like if you were to put it on, on your systems. Now, as a network and transit layer, it has a strong degree of encryption and it has an almost routine ish. But it has flaws. It's decentralized and it's not dynamic. Uh, data is passed by peers, and that the way it's transmitted via the network is changed every 10 minutes, which means there's a transient tool trust one which is you know there for 10 minutes. It's point to point and there are lots and lots of issues with ITP addressing. You know, stu see the stuff by every encryption. So I don't think it's fucking fascinating. It's much better than this talk, this talk shit. You should go watch that one. You've also got friends friendly. Uh, the guy who came up with busy help, who knows how to write a spreadsheet, came up with friend to friend networking. So spreadsheets, anonymous networking. Yeah, I can see the connection there, that works. Now, that again is direct peer to peer network with no third parties, e.g., your friends. The clue is in the name. What you do is you use pre shared information, be it a password, be it a certificate, and you use that for authentication. Lots of shit uses it waste, free net, retro share, blah, 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 blah. It sounds great on paper, but it's not, it's not without force. Users of F2F have no mechanism to establish who else is using F2F other than their friends. So, you know, just because I'm friends with you, I don't know who you're fucking friends with. And your friends could be, I don't know, fucking government and shit. In fact, there's some people here that probably are my friends in the government. And I'd like to say a very warm welcome, and I'd also like to thank you for the welcome I received, where border control went through all my shit for two hours. And ask such interesting questions, such as holding up a bottle of whiskey and saying, what is this? <laughs> and the correct response to that is not happiness in a bottle. 
<laughs> also, when you are flying on September the 11th, and they say, what day is this? The correct response is not Wednesday. <laughs> also, when they ask you what happened on this day, the correct response is not, you got up, had some eggs, came to work, gave me a hard time. They get really busy there. <laughs> anyway, back to our trip. But my travel plans were, you know, exciting. Basically, um, this point to point, and as I say, you exchange data with friends, but you don't know who, you're there for, you're, who the friends of your friends are. Yep, uh, moving on. All data has got to be encrypted by the user at the point of origin. If you don't encrypt it, F2F just says, oh, yeah, send it anyway. I don't care. I'm just a pro, well, I'll do whatever you want. There were attempts to mass market it as an idea, but basically they fell through, and a lot of the projects are now dead, or on their way to being dead, apart from posts of the free net. And it's got a transient of the trust, because you know, I don't know who you are, I don't know who your friends are. Brings me on to Tor. Everybody likes Tor. Unless you live in a cave, you know what Tor is. If you live in a cave and you're called Al, and your second name's Khalida, you again probably know what Tor is. Um, it was originally sponsored by the US Naval Research Lab. Um, 2002, there was an alpha version that was pushed out, and a guy called Roger Dinkledine and colleagues. Roger Dinkledine, I just like the guy's name, it's lyrical. Mr. Dinkledine. Mr. Dinkledine's magic house of Emporium and London. Stepping time and plain sight shall through me have an anonymity of anonymity. And booty, it is pretty. Um, basically, we pushed it out of using it since 2004. So, we've got, what, about a 10 year old technology here? And it's effectively about enabling anonymity, anonymity by using open nodes or real points. Now, all traffic via subset by Tor is only written. That's why it's called Tor, as it says, the only printer. Um, now that's communicated by, as I say, open nodes or open relays, and there's about 3,000 of them ish. Um, basically, how the only routing works is both the data and the destination are encrypted at the point of origin, and it just bounces around it, and that bounces around until it gets where it's going, and then the encryption is taken off it. Uh, basically, Tor seeks to prevent surveillance by separating the identification of data and network routing, and with running relay. And why is there a reference to something called Fascia? Well, in the 90s, there was a TV show in the UK called Fascia, and one of their characters, because it was a comedy show, allegedly, used to run towards the screen very, very fast, and then go, you ain't seen me, right? And that's what Tor does. That's kind of its thing. Now, hidden services were introduced into Tor in about 04. Hidden service is a service that server that's only configured to accept connections made via their TLD. Wouldn't you? Uh, when people talk about the dark web and they talk and talk and talk about the hidden parts of the internet and we're all going to die, this is what they're talking about. They're talking about government art. And there's some ratio on that. The comedy forums are fascinating if you're called Brian. So, Tor is not without its problems, ladies and gentlemen. We know this now. It was designed to prevent traffic analysis of data in transit. That's what it was there to do. Yeah? In 07, a, guy called, a Swedish guy called Danny Gustav basically set up a few tolerance to see what was sent. And he saw some very interesting things being sent, like poems from embassies and shit. And he saw other people setting up exit nodes, like the US government and shit, and the British government and shit. And they could read all the things too. In 09, Moxie, who was here a few years ago, used SSL strip to extract data that was sent via Tor, which was beautiful and made of me laugh. In 2011, a bunch of French researchers at the CIA basically claimed to have been able to decrypt the columns carried via Tor. By creating a network map, they claimed to be able to extract the crypto keys that were the seeds that were sent via Tor. Tor went, no, you can't. No, 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 no. But then last month what happened was a flaw was pushed out uh, in the Tor browser bundle, which basically, by default, Firefox 17 had to have JavaScript enabled. What could possibly fucking go wrong? 
Well, what went wrong is you had to ask for and said, hello, you've got JavaScript in the enabled. May I have your IP address, please? And the computer went, okay. As you know, it wasn't one of us. And nobody's really sure who did it, but, you know, we now kind of know who did it. Uh, because basically, it was, it was presented as a mechanism of finding users of child porn, which I actually agree with. If you're using anonymizing technologies to look at pictures of kids, then quite frankly, good. We found you good. We can put you in fucking jail. This is a good thing. However, the same company that allegedly hosted lots of the WCP sites also, also hosted Tormail. Which, again, yeah, anybody who visited Tormail on their shit with Firefox and JavaScript enabled got their IP sent somewhere. Who could possibly be interested in Tormail? Who could possibly be interested in the activist sites for that? Who knows? Maybe it was the same people that wanted to look up predators. I don't know. In July this year, uh, what we heard about in September, this month, I'm at least fucking current, if not entertaining, uh, the US Naval Research Lab basically did some research on identifying Tor users as traffic correlation. Um, so the guys that invented Tor then broke Tor. <laughs> so good, good work guys. Took you 10 years but you got there. Basically if you are or have access to an autonomous system, which you will typically find in ISP land, or if you can run you with ISP, you can map routed traffic. That's its point. And that's what they did. And they claimed that it found 80% of all Tor users. Identified, found, know where they are, know who they are, know what they're looking at. They may just have been trying to take the shine out of prison by saying, look, we can do that shit too, and we're an US Navy. Now, nobody, of course, would mess with an autonomous system. Unless, of course, you actually went to the BDP talk at DEF CON. And now you know how to mess with an autonomous system. Or you were a government. Because they go to death on two, you know. Now, this leads me to conclude that, you know, would you, as a government, admit um, a technology to be opened up to the public from, you know, effectively a branch of the government you do the fucking Navy, if you don't know how to fucking close it down again? I don't think you would. That would be stupid, even by American standards. Now, Tor is not a false flag. I am not saying that. It is a fantastic bit of logic and a fantastic application of anonymity. Yeah? It does have shit wrong with it though. And we're finding out that there's more shit wrong with it. Like the government actually know who 80% of the people who use Tor are. That's pretty fucking wrong for an anonymizing technology. It's not a fucking anonymous thing. It has failed. It has ceased to be. So, the internet pisses me off, as you may have realised. Because it is in fact not cake, and I cannot eat it. It does allow me to masturbate, though, so, so you know it has redeeming features. Anonymity pisses me off because when most people think about anonymity, they automatically think about child porn. And just because somebody wants to be anonymous doesn't mean they want to interfere with kids. And I kind of resent that fucking implication. You know, the only people that are interested in anonymity are terrorists. Child molesters, drug dealers, or dissidents. Now, I'm kind of a bit of dissidency, as you may have realised at this point, but I'm sure as shit not a child molester. I probably will at some point be classified as a terrorist, and that would be hilarious because then I get a free trip to Cuba. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the random reaction you get to um, stuff like uh, F2F and the fact it's struggling and nobody's taking it up is it's summed up beautifully by this statement. Why don't people use free net? Because you know, I suspect most people don't like the idea of trading child porn. Well, I suspect most people don't like the fucking concept of not being able to be fucking anonymous, which is why that guy and anybody who thinks that can fuck the fuck right off. The guy's a fucking cock. You don't say shit like that. Just because I don't want the government or anybody else knowing my business does not mean I touch kids, and that fucking pisses me off. So, what am I actually shining about? Or what will I try and be shining about? I'm talking about something called a drift net. 
Um, it's first discussed here, and it's first discussed now. Are you sitting comfortably? I hope so, because I'm about to begin. This is Julian. Julian's Australian. He's got shiny hair and thinks he's in the Matrix. <laughs> yeah. And next to him, next to him, we've got a now Chelsea, who, you know, doesn't have shiny hair and doesn't live in the Matrix. He now lives in jail. But before he went to the other, Julian and Chelsea are friends. They want to communicate like friends. Because they're friends and they get along. They're nice guys. Or nice guy and nice girl, they actually, but yeah. Okay. As well as being friends with Julian, though, Chelsea has an acquaintance called Adrian. And, you know, he's only an acquaintance and doesn't know Julian at all. But they still want to talk because talking is nice. And good things happen when you talk, like you go to jail. <laughs> so they can talk. But it turns out that actually Adrian's a bit of a snitching bitch. He's actually a bit of a douche. So they don't want to talk to Adrian anymore because he's a bit of a cock. So they fuck him off and then they can carry on talking. And then poor, poor Adrian is so very alone and everybody's left him. Which is why he looks so sad. Although he has got an awesome couple of pimples. Just saying. Snitchy and angry, poor bastard. So, drift notes. They're a similar idea to F2F and ITP. They're very different things. Uh, basically, what you have if you have something we're calling a collier revocation engine, which is in charge of the addressing of notes and where shit be going. How we communicate is via IUP and HTTPU. We are the only company other than Cisco and Microsoft that have our own implementation of IUP. So suck it, bitches! We've been working on this shit for five years in our own language stack and with our own protocol sets. It took a long, long fucking time. And you do not know how close to insanity it has fucking pushed me. Now, note. Uh, which can consist of direct or indirect peers, hence the idea of F to F, yeah, can drop depending upon the trust model. Now, yeah. unlike ITP or F to F, drift nets are dynamic. The clue is in the name. That's why we gave it that name. That's what we were thinking. If you're a node, you can join or you can drop at will. Yeah? If you're a trusted node, and this is the sexy part, ladies and gents, if you are a trusted node, you can create a net split any time you fucking want. So if you're talking to Adrian, who turns out to be a bitch, you can just say, bye, which is a wonderful idea. Basically, um, you've got addressing that's handled by a client. You have to do a client on the side of the school. I'm very sorry, it's the only way you can get it working. And uh, it's addressed and resolved in the same sort of way as talk. So if we've got our own, you know, TLD, because we wanted to too, because we wanted to play. Now, because of the transport layer, AG HTTP, that's HTTP over UDP, not TCP IP, because, you know, TCP IP can just suck it. Uh, we can send whatever we want. Any data we can send. You have a video file, no other problem. We can send that. Yeah. How do drift next drift? Well, you've got keys that are rotated uh, by friends, direct peers. This can be done on a timed basis or on an as requested basis. Um, so, as I say, Adrian's an arse, let's stop talking to him. Let's go, done. Now, no one's going to say rotate keys and also publish revocation requests, and you know, the drift net thing. Now, since you only rotate the keys with your friends, not your acquaintances, a remote peer can't actually keep a key and forward an incorrect one. Can't do it. Not there to do it. Now, long story short, if you're a direct peer, you can force a net split whenever you want. In that scenario, the drift net hops, e.g. the revocation panel says to the client, well, there's an, we were there, but we're now going there. Come on, follow me, it'll be fun. And basically, carries over everything and everyone apart from unwanted third parties. So they'll suck it. 
Now, you can drift a runner, you can drift whatever, you can drift whatever you want, like, you know, issue in your application, a request, or it does it as a matter of course anyway, just because, you know, you can't shoot what you can't see, ladies and gents. It's a good idea. Now, we have stolen a shit ton of ideas. Freely, I freely hold my hand up. We ripped everybody off that we could. Just because, you know, we are lazy bastards. We stole the idea of the circle trust. We stole the idea of women's style addressing. We also nicked the idea of women's style encryption because it works. <laughs> so you steal what works. We're also doing a few things that are different. We do address it differently. I'm not telling you how we do address it differently because then you steal my toys. And fuck you, you work it out. We had to. Um, we also do the circles of trust and revocation differently. Anybody can join any time they want. If they're not recognised, however, there's an exit. So the government comes along and says, that looks interesting, let's have a look see. They try and join, as know, of course they can, but then the driftman goes, I don't know you, you can fuck off. Which, you know, does make surveillance a little bit trickier. We don't have session state. I'm not, I'm not going to actually um, claim that we did. But we do deploy and manage servers carefully. That's how it works. We also have our own implementation of the transport layer. And we also have the idea of nodes and the revocation engines creating exploits. Now, we also have a way of messing with traffic analysis, which may involve some sending encrypted knobs, which may have route traversal information, which may also have the line, lol, just kidding at the end. <laughs> Word dicks. <laughs> now, what we've got though is a decent F to F implementation with a custom stack, and the important bit, the mobility of addressing over time, or as it relates to an incident. Should be bad when it's run away. <clears throat> now, what I think this means is you can't shoot what you can't see. Unless you want to get really fucking bored as a hunter, you have to be able to shoot what you can fucking see or have access to nuclear firearms and then, or nuclear weapons and then you just press the fucking button and take everything out. I also think the public internet is fucking doomed. Absolutely fucking doomed. Because people are getting increasingly aware that it's a lie. I mean, I hope you are. If you use the concept of driftnet and addressing the driftnets, you can greatly increase the surveillance overhead. Really, really fucks with them. It's funny. You can also, however, reduce attack exposure. Because as an attacker, how are you going to attack what you can't find? It makes shit really hard. You know, you can't just blindly send shit off because there's not, nothing to send shit off to. And if anything does ever tap it, you can just go up and next click on it anyway. Because that shit happens by, you know, default. And my other conclusion is we all need to be slightly concerned about privacy and thinking of new solutions to ensuring we stay private. What are we going to do with the idea? What we've got in terms of POC is slow as crap and it's grungy and dirty and horrible, but it works. I'm proud to say it works. All of this is written up in our language stack, our proprietary stuff that we wrote, because we know we're a vendor too, and we've got to have proprietary shiny. And we're not sure what we're going to do with it, which is why I'm here. I don't know whether it's made commercial, which means we've got to provide support and do nice things like that. Fuck that, I ain't answering fans. Or we can make it open source and give it to you people and you can have fun and then I get to be called a terrorist and get three trips to fucking Cuba. We're working on making something stable. And our hope is to get that out by the end of the year or beginning of next, depending on how much time we actually can you know, steal off our clients when we should be working on their shit. Um, and we need to make absolutely implicit that it works. Because if it doesn't work, then it's fucked. <laughs> and I basically have wasted your time, which I don't like doing. I have wasted my time for the last five fucking years, which I definitely don't like doing. Now, I've got some conclusions. As security professionals, or fucking serfs, depending on how you see yourself now, um, or indeed just as people that give a fuck, we need to start speak, speaking and thinking about privacy. And not just thinking it's for the paedophiles or the terrorists. Now, governments, whether they're despots or not, don't like privacy. Now, we also have to start using tech instead of letting it use us. 
And, you know, as a citizen of the state, you know, privacy is a basic need. This is why you live in a house that has doors. That's why you have doors. Which I find it ironic that the biggest OS is called Windows. Who's <laughs> in the name? <laughs> now, you may have thought that you just sat for a sales talk. I use the word I use the word fuck too much for this to be a sales talk. So that's why you haven't. Um, what you have sat through is our implementation of DriftNet. The concept, however, is yours. Take it, steal it, do something good with it, please. You know, I have no problem having a fucking competitor, be it an open source or a commercial one, as long as it's doing the same thing and we get privacy back. So take this idea, please. Rip me off. This is an open invitation to rip me off. Because if everybody has a private mobile network, and I'm not talking about GSM mobility, I'm talking about addressing mobility, if everybody is not one of those, surveillance becomes really fucking prohibitive. You have to do things like go to telcos, and if you do things like go to telcos, telcos would tell fucking reporters. That's the fucking point. If everybody has a private mobile network, the attack surface isn't there. I can't attack you because I can't fucking find you to attack you. That's the point. This breaks our industry. Fuck you. I've made you all redundant. Ha! <laughs> yes. So, I reckon it's time that we all start, start shouting theatre in the crowded fucking fire that is this planet. In the crowded fucking fire that is this industry. We need, as individuals, a responsible, ethical, moral, fucking human beings to start shouting theatre. And what you need to decide for yourselves is whether you're a fucking hacker or a serf. If you are a hacker, you get shit built. That is your fucking job. Fuck your house, fuck your car, fuck your boss. Build something. I don't fucking care. That is your job. And that is the message I'm trying to get across. You people need to make shit. The same way we make shit. Do it. Take it. Steal it. It is yours. Be gone. I am done. If you have any questions, shout them out. I may or may not respond. In fact, I won't respond because it's five o'clock, so fuck you. If you have questions, come and find me. Yeah, I said it was for the sales talk. If you want to hire us though, you can. Thanks, bye.